Uh, my name is Maxi Marlinspike. I'm from the Institute for Disruptive Studies. Um, I don't really like introductions, so instead today I'm going to introduce two friends of mine, um, Shane and Sarah, probably two of my favorite people in the world. And um, exactly one year ago today, they were hiking in Kurdish Iraq and were kidnapped by uh, the Iranian military. And for the past year, they've been held in prison in Iran. Um, Sarah has been in solitary confinement, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any sign of uh, them being released. Um, this, it's a pretty disempowering situation. You know, there's nothing that I or anyone that I know can do. But um, I think about them all the time, and uh, I just want other people to know that you know, people are stuck in prison in Iran, and uh, it's been exactly one year as of today. All right. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I would like to take some time to talk about privacy. Um, what I'd like to do is start by looking into the past, uh, talking about the threats that we saw, the things that we thought were important. Uh, the projects that we thought were worth working on. And then I want to talk a little bit about how I feel like trends have changed and uh, then look into the future and talk a little bit about uh, things that I think might be important moving forward, uh, things that I'm interested in working on and that maybe other people might be interested in working on. So looking into the past, the sort of technology narrative of the 90s uh, was largely dominated by a clicker that doesn't work. Uh, by this thing. No, I'm just not going to use this. The web browser. Uh, when Netscape first introduced Netscape Navigator, it was almost revolutionary. And uh, a lot of people moved to capitalize on that knowledge. Uh, in particular, one of the major players that wanted to protect their interests was uh, Microsoft. And uh, when they in introduced uh, Internet Explorer, the narrative changed uh, just from uh, the uh, idea of a browser to uh, this browser war uh, between uh, Netscape and Internet Explorer. And we all know how the browser wars turned out. Uh, but at the same time, there was, there was another war that was happening. And it was um, somewhat more subtle, but it was just as fierce and perhaps more important. And it was a war over this thing uh, the little padlock uh, in the bottom left hand corner of the web browser and more importantly, the technology behind it. Uh, on one side of this war uh, were the cypherpunks. These are people who wanted to see this uh, information and technology spread widely. They wanted to proliferate this throughout the world so that many people could use it. And on the other side of this war were the eavesdroppers. And these were people who wanted to prevent the spread of this information and uh, stifle the use of this technology. And so the lines were drawn. And on the cypherpunk side, you had people like Matt Blaze, uh, Philip Zimmerman, Ian Goldberg, David Shom, and Timothy May, the heroes of my teenage years. And the eavesdroppers thought that these people were dangerous. In fact, their ideas scared the fuck out of them. <laughs> they were talking about the move from a world where they had ultimate control and ultimate access to all information to a world where they would have no control and no access to any information. In fact, they thought this was so dangerous that they classified these ideas as weapons. That if you wrote a little bit of crypto code and sent it to your friend in Canada, that was tantamount to exporting munitions and you could be tried and prosecuted as such. At the same time, however, they realized that you know, this privacy thing might be important to some people and that you know, this idea might catch on. And so uh, they decided to come up with their own solution, um, which they called key escrow and uh, was best embodied by this thing, the clipper chip. Uh, what they wanted to do was make this chip and then embed it into every piece of consumer communications electronics, every telephone, every fax machine, every personal computer. And what it would do is uh, some cryptography. But it was a, a closed system and you wouldn't be able to get access to the internals of this chip. Uh, and you would be able to use it to uh, start secure sessions. The only trick was that um, the government would have like the equivalent of a master key which they could then use to decrypt anything that they thought might be interesting. 
So uh, the eavesdropper's problem here was that um, cryptography is not a banana. <laughs> Which is to say that uh, it's difficult to treat information as objects, right? You know, if I have a banana and I give it, share it with my friend, um, there is still only one banana in the world. Uh, if they then share it with a friend of theirs, there is still only one banana in the world. Uh, however, information works differently. Every time I share information, uh, I'm copying it, and there's a chance for an exponential explosion. Uh, this uh, sort of fundamental dilemma is, was made worse by a cypherpunk mantra. Cypherpunks write code. The idea was that a lot of good work had been done in academia and research circles uh, developing public key cryptography and uh, other encryption systems outside the, the government realm. But uh, not a lot had been done to actually put it into practice. And what cypherpunks wanted were, was actual software that people would download and use right now to communicate secur securely. And so they kind of went nuts. Uh, some people moved to Anguilla, uh, an island in the Caribbean that had very favorable laws in terms of exporting cryptography and started writing crypto code and trying to ship it throughout the world. Um, there were more creative strategies like in uh, 1995, uh, Philip Zimmerman published a book uh, in conjunction with MIT Press called PGP, Source Code and Internals. And the deal was that uh, the book was just the entire PGP source code printed in a machine readable font. Because, um, you know, if digital representations of cryptography uh, were weapons, but if you printed it in a book, that was speech. Uh, so they printed this whole thing in a book and a very small print run and then, uh, you know, just shipped it to every country in the world where they wanted to see this. And then people, they just scanned it back in because it was a machine readable font. And now uh, PGP had been distributed completely legally all over the world. So, you know, this kind of stuff continued and, I mean, the strategies got more and more rabid and uh, cryptography became more and more ubiquitous um, until 2000 when suddenly the Clinton administration repealed all of the significant laws uh, limiting the export of cryptography. And so what side is, it, it sort of seemed like the game was over, that the, the world was won. If you go back and you look at uh, the cypherpunk predictions about what would happen once cryptography was ubiquitous. Uh, the, f the first prediction uh, uh, that they made was simply that it would become ubiqu ubiquitous, that it would inevitably uh, spread throughout the world. And this turned out to be their most prescient prediction. This was really one of the first times that we saw that information really does want to be free. But if you, you look at um, their predictions of what would happen once it was ubiquitous, they were somewhat less prescient. Um, that anonymous digital cash would flourish, that intellectual property would disappear, that surveillance would become impossible, uh, that governments would then be unable to continue collecting taxes, and that governments would fall. If we flash forward 10 years from when these predictions were made, um, cryptography is the thing that allows you to securely transmit your credit card number to Amazon.com so you can buy a copy of Sarah Palin's book on going rogue. <laughs> You know, sure, some of these um, ideas have been eroded somewhat, um, but surveillance is probably at an all-time high, while privacy is probably at an all-time low. So what happened? You know, it sort of seemed like we were waging this war, and it seemed like we won the war, and, and now here we are in this strange situation. Well, I think uh, part of my thesis here is that uh, in many ways, I feel like the cypherpunks were preparing for a future. Uh, and the future that they anticipated was fascism. But what we got was social democracy. And that's not necessarily better, it's just different. Um, let me give you an example. How many people in this room would feel good about a law which uh, required everyone to carry a government mandated tracking device with them at all times? Yeah, no, not even one person, all right. So that's, that's fascism, right? That's the fascist future. Um, now let me ask another question. How many people here uh, carry a mobile phone? <laughs> right, Pretty, I, I'm guessing actually 100% of the people in this room. Um, and so that's social democracy, right? Because so what is the difference between a government mandated tracking device and a mobile phone? You know, a, a mobile phone is just a, a tracking device that reports your real time position to uh, one of a few telecommunications companies, which are required by law to turn that information over to the government. 
So logistically, they're the same, you know. Um, so what is the difference? You can turn it off, but you don't. <laughs> Psychological. Choice. <laughs> and, and you pay for one. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Choice, right? Choice is the big difference, you know. You choose to carry a cell phone, uh, and you you wouldn't choose to carry this government mandated tracking device. Um, so let's talk about that, you know. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would have a cell phone. Why would I? You know, it's a mobile tracking device, it's a mobile bug, it operates over an insecure protocol. Why would I want one of these things? Uh, and yet I have one. And I carry it with me all the time, every day. Well, I think if we look at the way that people tend to communicate and coordinate in groups, uh, often there are sort of informal uh, mechanisms and channels that people use to uh, communicate and to uh, make plans and stay in touch. And if I introduce a more codified communications channel, there's a well-known problem called the no network effect where uh, I invent this thing maybe like the GSM cellular network and I start using it but uh, it's difficult to use because the value of that network is uh, in the number of nodes that are connected to it. And if I'm the only one using it then it's really not worth very much. If, however, I somehow manage to get everyone uh, to start using this thing then it becomes very useful and very valuable. Uh, but there's, there's an interesting side effect which is that the old uh, informal methods of communication and coordination are destroyed. That technology actually changes the fabric of society. Uh, I mean there are many sort of trivial or trite examples of this uh, in the mobile phone uh, world, right, where you know we see that mobile phones have changed the way that people make plans, right. It used to be that people made plans, you know, they say I'll meet you on the street corner at this time and we'll go to this thing. And now people say I'll call you when I'm getting off work. And so if you don't have uh, that piece of technology, uh, you can't participate in the way that uh, society is uh, communicating or coordinating. Uh, and so uh, what actually ends up happening is now if I decide that I don't want to participate in this codified communications channel, I'm once again victim to the no network effect. Because what I'm trying to do is go pe be a part of a network that has been destroyed. Um, that no longer exists and I'm once again the only one using it uh, and I'm part of a network that has very little value. So yes, I made a choice, right, to have a cell phone but what kind of choice did I make? Um, and I, I think that this is the way that things tend to go now. That what ends up happening is the choices start out very simple. Uh, do I have a piece of consumer electronics in my pocket or not? And over time, the scope of that choice slowly expands until it becomes a choice to participate in society or not. That on some level today, <coughs> to choose not to have a cell phone means in some sense to choose not to participate in society. And so I think if we start looking at this pattern of small choices becoming uh, big choices, you start to see them everywhere. Uh, one of my favorite most, most recent examples is uh, from this uh, Firefox extension called Adblock Plus. I'm sure that many people are familiar with this. The idea is that it's uh, supposed to help you block ads on the web. And the way it works is it allows you to specify um, a set of regular expressions uh, that would match URLs that would be advertising URLs uh, for ad banners and stuff like that. <coughs> And um, the problem with this is, you know, it's quite effective but uh, these URLs are constantly changing and so you want to be changing your regular expressions as well and it, it could be kind of a pain to try and keep up with that. So they've done a clever thing where they have a, a subscription model where what you can do is you can subscribe to a list of regular expressions that someone else is maintaining. Uh, that way, you know, you only need one person or a group of people who are sort of on the ball uh, looking at these regular expressions and everyone else just benefits uh, from uh, that research. And um, now, uh, so there's a number of popular subscriptions and uh, they're not all for um, ads, right? So there's a few popular subscriptions for blocking trackers. You know, these are like web bugs that track your movements around uh, the web as you browse along. And so I'm subscribed to one of these uh, tracker lists. And uh, of course one of the trackers that I'm most interested in blocking is Google Analytics. Uh, because, you know, there's no problem with Google Analytics at all. And one day something interesting happened. 